everybody. <laughs> Senator Wickland, two Senate file 2002. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senate file 2002. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion um, just today about, um, and all session really, about the issues Minnesotans are facing related to health care costs, access to prescription drugs, and um, health care insurance coverage. Um, high health care costs affect everyone and also affect state government budgets as well as employer budgets. Given the increases in health care spending in Minnesota, and the significant amount of total spending, uh, the Department of Health estimated that in 2017, um, the, the total spending in healthcare in Minnesota was over $50 billion. Um, it's clear that we all would benefit from identifying strategies to contain costs. Uh, one area that I'd like to see us explore in an ongoing way is studying state healthcare spending and setting up health care uh, spending targets. Uh, the governor has a proposal to establish a commission with a technical advisory council to study and um, address health care spending targets. Uh, Senate file 2002 would establish a uh, health care affordability board and a health care affordability advisory council. The board um, will have duties such as uh, requesting publicly available information and unique custom data sets from agencies. The board shall monitor the administration and reform of the healthcare delivery and payment systems in the state. Um, other duties relate to making recommendations for legislative policy. Um, and then the board would establish an office of patient protection um, that would assist consumers with issues related to access and quality of healthcare. Uh, the council would, uh, the advisory council would report technical recommendations and a summary of it, its activities to the board and measure the impact of healthcare spending growth targets on diverse communities and populations, including but not limited to those communities and populations adversely affected by health disparities. So there would be, um, the governor's proposal is similar. Um, the, the structure, the exact structure is slightly different um, in terms of uh, where it's established and some of the responsibilities. Um, but overall, uh, the goal is to do work around um, analysis and um, reporting and implementing uh, cost growth um, or strategies to address cost growth. Uh, there are different options that we could pursue in setting this up. Senator Utke had a bill, um, has a bill this year, Senate File 922, which would uh, create a health care uh, commission, policy commission, and uh, has some similar uh, duties, um, but doesn't have a, an enforcement mechanism like a, a spending uh, or our cost growth target. Um, to me, it's important for us to see that um, we are putting a structure in place that will have specific responsibilities um, in the areas of analysis, to analyze spending, uh, which would help us understand cost trends and cost growth drivers. Uh, it ha would have uh, um, responsibilities for reporting, to publish performance against the target and analysis of cost growth drivers, uh, to identify strategies to slow cost growth, and um, eventually to be able to implement strategies to slow cost growth. Other states have um, done more work in this area than we have done formally. We have uh, done health economics work, and we have uh, a great group of people who are working, uh, working on this, but we haven't established a formal um, entity like some other states. For example, Massachusetts has a Center for Health Information and Analysis. Um, it's an independent agency that is designated to uh, collect, analyze, and disseminate healthcare information. And they um, also provide analysis of healthcare spending trends. They will, um, they do set um, targets and have ways to um, implement some imp improvement plans if targets are not met. Um, so I would like this session to be able to move forward with um, 
with a, one of this forms of ideas, whether it's exactly Senate File 2002 or um, the governor's proposal. I've been working with the Department of Health staff to um, talk about the, the differences and similarities and, and to come up with, I'd like to come up with the best um, option for us to, to move forward in establishing um, this type of health care affordability board. Um, and I think there are a couple people who signed up to testify if you'd like to go to those, but I'd happy to answer any other questions. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we have Mr. Bentley Graves and Mary Crinky. You can both come up to the table. Mr. Graves, introduce yourself and please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair members. My name is Bentley Graves from the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. Um, as I think many of you know, I, I often start uh, my testimony by saying we work on health care issues because of the cost considerations for our members. And that ties in very well with uh, the subject of, uh, of the chair's bill this evening. Um, and I want to thank the chair for, for taking uh, some time earlier this week in a very busy time to sit down and kind of talk through um, her goals for this bill um, and some of the opportunities that exist around this discussion. Um, the chair made mention of Senate File 922, which, which is a bill being carried by Senator Uckey. Um, it's a bill that, uh, that we strongly support and have for some time. Um, and while there is, as, as uh, Chair Wickland mentioned, a, a good bit of overlap, there are some, 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 some important differences between the two approaches. Um, and we think that there are some, uh, there's reason to kind of look at, at some of those differences and, and dig into them a little bit more. First and foremost, I would note that, you know, with Senate File 922, um, the, the goal is to have a, a commission like this that is, that is truly independent and, and independent of um, uh, the kind of the political push and pull uh, that otherwise tends to kind of bog us down around the, the discussion of our own health care costs and issues here at the Capitol. Um, so unlike, um, unlike Senate File 2002, um, Senate File 922 would, would have a very specific uh, number of seats around the table for, for specific experts in their field. Um, and unlike um, uh, what is traditionally the model of having the governor appoint some and the speaker appoint some and the majority leaders appoint some and majority appoint some as well, um, this group, and, uh, as designed in Senate File 922, uh, the experts would be chosen, you know, for their expertise, but we, but would be uh, appointed outside of that political process, and would be appointed with input from uh, the state demographer, um, the legislative auditor, uh, the state economist, and an appointment from, and somebody from the, the Federal Reserve, all of whom have done work on healthcare costs and healthcare cost trends over time all of whom bring uh, kind of different expertise to, to try to figure out who best to sit around that, that, that table. So we think that there's a lot of value in having that independence. Um, that is something that is, that is uh, uh, different than, than the approach in Senate File 2002. Um, but we would also, we all, we'd also argue that, that there may be value in starting with something less than kind of a full regulatory body, something that um, mirrors uh, what uh, the, the, the federal government through Congress uh, has with MedPAC which is a recommending body. Um, and while that obviously doesn't have the force and weight of a regulatory body, um, at last check, the, the success rate, I guess, as I would put it, with, with the recommendations that MedPAC makes to Congress um, is fairly high, and I'll be as recommendations. Um, but I think there's, there's, there's value in, in, in maybe starting with something like that before moving on to a full kind of regulatory body where we're setting kind of global targets and trying to enforce those um, but maybe starting, starting with a recommending body with these experts uh, that can help advise the legislature on issues of cost, but also you know, be able to take uh, issues that the legislature maybe finds a little too difficult to solve in the political arena, hand off to this group, and, and come back with recommendations. So again, I, I very much appreciate the conversation that I've had with the chair thus far. Um, appreciate the work that Senator Uckey has done on, on uh, Senate File 922. I think there's, there's a lot of places of overlap and I think a lot of opportunities to, to kind of work forward on something that would serve both the legislature and the state of Minnesota well, and I appreciate the opportunity to offer this input today. Thank you. Ms. Krinke. Ma Madam Chair and members of the committee, for the record, my name is Mary Krinke and I'm with the Minnesota Hospital Association. We do have concerns with Senate File 2002. And as you all know, we're seeing more and more individuals with chronic health care conditions that require increased spending. 
This past winter, um, we saw a sudden rise in RSV and super high volumes at our children's hospitals. Right now, hospitals have high costs associated with boarding patients who no longer need acute care services, but there are no discharge options available for these individuals. There are young people with mental health issues that are boarding in our emergency rooms because there's not uh, other community places for them to be served. All of these costs are coming to hospitals, yet they're really not acute care costs. So we have concerns about how would this be measured and what really is deemed to be acute care costs versus other costs that the hospitals are just doing as being a safety net provider across our state. The bill establishes a politically appointed board and advisory council to develop recommendations on large-scale healthcare transformation. These broad responsibilities and directives from the board have very little limited legislative oversight. This process offers few opportunities for partnership and ignores the significant work already being done by state agencies and private health care organizations. Rather than creating a new entity, appreciated the comments from Senator Wicklund, um, there's already the Minnesota Department of Health that could be leveraged to accomplish similar goals with existing transparent partnerships that the state and provider organizations have. If expertise outside the Minnesota Department of Health's current capacity is needed, this could be accomplished with legislative direction and appropriations to the Health Economics Department. As Senator Wicklund mentioned, there is an alternative that is included in this year's MDH's budget bill, Senate File 2995, which creates a health care spending growth target commission. I know that just rolls right off your tongue. Health care spending growth target commission. Uh, this is similar, but it is different than Senate File 2002. Um, one concerning provision of Senate File 2002 is the power given to this affordability board. If healthcare entities exceed the spending growth target under the bill, they would be subject to performance improvement plans that would then be submitted to the healthcare affordability board. We're very worried that this could shift resources from patient care to cost compliance. This could hurt our patients that we're trying to serve. The bill also allows the imposition of civil penalties to healthcare entities for non-compliance. We see this as an overreach that could be detrimental to many of the hospitals across the state. I want to be clear that analyzing healthcare spending in Minnesota does not require establishing a new regulatory power with severe civil penalties. MHA appreciates its long-standing strong partnership with the Minnesota Department of Health, and we believe that this is a better approach and would support strengthening the current efforts there through our Minnesota Department of Health rather than creating a new affordability board. Thank you. Thank you. Members, questions? Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, uh, thank you to our testifiers, and thank you to S Senator Wickland. Uh, you did mention the uh, kind of a companion bill that I've got, and I won't go into many of the details because uh, Mr. Graves and Ms. Crinky did talk about some of those already. Um, and a big part of it was the makeup of the board, and um, without the enforcement uh, part of it, but, you know, and, and I, I guess actually I was going to go into the board, but it's already been mentioned that our preference are, would be to have a board um, that's less political and more um, fit for what we would hope that the result would be, um, getting people that are experts in each one of these uh, positions. Um, so hopefully we can continue to uh, work on that part of it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the one th concern that I had from that board, in addition, was uh, on 11.4, the fact that they could, uh, uh, you know, if it led to a civil penalty of up to $500,000, and that seems like a uh, quite a hefty penalty coming from that board. And I guess I, I skipped over one of the things that was kind of along the line of this board originally, 
and that's on uh, 3.5. And one of the suggestions also would be for the, how is it worded here, that the board may employ or contract for professional or technical assistance um, for actuarial assistance and hopefully that we could see that be rather than may that they should they must or something like that that uh, that would be a recommendation that I'd like to see um, for additional help to that board to strengthen it some and lastly the thing that uh, on the back page caught my attention big time was the fact that we'd be funding this from the Minnesota Pre Premium Security Plan and uh, that is a concern there too that uh, if, if something is to be funded I wish it, that we'd find a different way to uh, to look at this rather than to raid that uh, premium security account. So with that, um, I thank you Senator Wickland and hopefully we can uh, merge our bills a little bit and uh, come to something there that's uh, workable for everybody. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Ecke. Um Seeing no other questions, Senator Wicklund. Um, well, I just um, want to say thank you to the, the testifiers for additional input on, you know, how, how we might move forward with this in a more um, kind of a broader manner. And I appreciate your comments, Senator Ecke. I think the... Um, the types of appointments or, or people helping to make the appointments um, that is intriguing to me to get the expertise of some people who who could identify experts. Um, and I will definitely I'll talk more, more with the Department of Health and, and others about how we might implement something like this in a, a way that <clears throat> allows us to gather um, gather information, uh, be able to present it, um, and then also make recommendations about what changes we might want to make um, going forward. And I appreciate your comments about the penalties. Um, I think we're, we're looking for ways that we can um, provide incentives for the type of cost containment that, that I think all of us are, are looking for. But um, I, your point is well taken about you know how much should that be and what is the impact of a, a penalty like that? So, thank you. Thank you, Senator. With that, we will be laying over 2002. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Bolden, you have uh, Senate File 2449. Is that the one you want to start with? Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, please proceed. I think you have, do you have an amendment? Yes, Madam Chair. I would move the A2 amendment, I believe. The A, uh, Senator Bolden moves the A2 amendment. Do we have the, or not? All right, can we start with the next one? I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Let's take it to the pages this morning. Okay, I'm seeing it. We're, we're looking for the amendments, so. Senator Bolden, so the A2 amendment is, it is an author's amendment. Um, do you want to talk about how it's um, set, how it's structured, and a little background? Or did you want one of your testifiers to do that? Um, I can speak to it, Madam Chair. Um, this amendment uh, makes some additional changes to add flexibility to assertive community treatment programs 
It removes county-based purchasing from Section 11 requirements. It removes rigid client eligibility criteria for peer services, broadening access to peer services for children and families. It adds specificity to data reporting under school-based behavioral health grants to streamline the grants reporting requirements. It changes proposed, the proposed timeline for timely filing standards for claims processing and managed care. And it adds uh, CCBHC policy changes uh, for re-entry into the national CCBHC demonstration and a direction to the commissioner to establish licensure for certified mental health programs. Thank you for describing them. Uh, members, um, Senator Bolden moves the A2 amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Bolden, to thank, your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair and members, in this moment, when increasing access to mental health care is critical for our state, we must take steps to streamline regulations, adapt to meet the workforce environment, and focus efforts on quality treatment. Paired with efforts to fix Medicaid reimbursements, the mental health services community is also working to clear unnecessary administrative underbrush from our care systems and align regulations with industry updates and standards and clients' needs. This will lessen barriers clients face in accessing care and allows providers to focus on care delivery to clients and communities, not on paperwork compliance. Senate File 2449, the Mental Health Legislative Network Regulations Streamlining Bill, builds off of the work done in, on mental health uniform service standards in past sessions. The Governor's Children's Therapeutic Services and Supports Working Group and other similar efforts where stakeholders collectively worked together to identify specific places where we could modernize regulation to increase access and make the best use of provider time. This bill language has been shared with DHS and we continue to work with them on technical assistance as they are able. I also would like to thank Senators Abler and Kupek for signing on to this bill. And um, now, Madam Chair, I would turn uh, over to my testifier, Shannon Brown, to speak further on the need for this legislation. Thank you, Ms. Brown. And please state your name for the record and, and pre proceed with your testimony. Shannon Brown. Chair Wickland and members of the committee, I'm the CEO at Fernbrook Family Center and I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to Senate File 2449. Everywhere you turn, you will hear stories of the mental health crisis facing kids and families of Minnesota. In my work at Fernbrook, I see this playing out daily. Our clients are suffering and our staff are overwhelmed and burdened by the significant needs. I regularly tell my staff that during times of crisis, we can find opportunity and that is what I would like to speak to today. The unprecedented mental health needs we're facing are challenging us to find better ways to do things through administrative simplification and streamlined requirements. This bill is intended to help providers do just that. Some of the highlights that I'd like to point out as amended include removing duplicative training requirements for clinical trainees, allowing clinical discretion in determining the best assessment tools to be used, all of the diagnostic assessments are signed off on by providers who are licensed by their state boards and have at least two years of experience. This would allow them to determine if additional assessment tools would be beneficial or necessary. Creating a clear path for provider certification with clearly laid out expectations. Currently, this process creates a significant amount of overhead administrative expense for providers as we have to spend time interpreting manuals and department personnel's expectations, which are not always aligned with payer expectations. This section streamlines this process and makes it straightforward for providers, which would reduce the expense significantly. It also creates consistency between expectations for MCO and Medicaid fee-for-service timely filing and prior authorizations. <clears throat> Additionally, this bill streamlines the reporting requirements for school-linked behavioral health grantees, and it adds CCBHC policy changes, re-entry to the national CCBHC demonstration, and a di direction to the commissioner to establish licensure for certified mental health programs. As I stated previously, the more streamlined and clear we can make these processes, the more time our providers can spend providing direct services to kids and families. We have seen exit interviews from staff repeatedly cite paperwork and administrative burdens as a reason for leaving. The work community mental health center staff, such as those at Fernbrook do, is already challenging. We don't need to add to the burden and risk of burnout by greater adding additional administrative requirements. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Palin, did you wish to testify? Oh, um, Madam Chair, Jenny Palin with MacMap. I'm just here to help with any questions. Okay, thank you. And then we have on, on Zoom, we have Ashley Dowis. Um, if you can please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Hello, I'm Ashley Dowis. Thank you, Madam Chair and the committee for, um, uh, for accepting my testimony today. Um, much of what I'm going to say is going to mirror what um, Shannon had testified. Um, I'd like to add um, our, the impact to our work. So I am the Director of Clinical Services at Family Service Rochester, uh, an agency that provides mental health services along with other social services. Um, I'm in support of the amendment to the documentation timelines. The five-day timeline um, is keeping our very limited um, resource of licensed mental health staff um, focused on administrative duties and not their talents um, in training, uh, providing direct service. Um, like shared in other testimony, this is increasing um, burnout and um, reducing job satisfaction as many of our licensed staff that have left our agency have also discussed how um, this has impacted um, their decision. Um, additionally, I think that this uh, this amendment helps increase the quality of the um, product that we are delivering by um, helping those who are first starting off in the field really get proper training in how to write assessments and having uh, more time to be able to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. I appreciate it. Um, uh, Ms. or Senator Bolden. Do you have any other comments? No, Madam Chair, welcome discussion or questions. Uh, members, any questions or comments? Senator Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just the, the one piece, I mean, the whole bill is so important, right? But the, the re-entry into the CCBHC program um, is such a big deal. Uh, we know so many providers who just kind of had their rugs pulled out from under them, and all of a sudden, their funding was all gone. Um, so incredibly important. Thank you very much. Members, any other questions, comments? Seeing no others, thank you, Senator Bolden, for bringing this bill forward, and thank you, uh, Ms. Palin, for working on um, the amendment, and we'll continue to work on um, whether there's other changes that are needed before um, before we move it into an omnibus bill. But um, at this point, we will lay the bill over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Next, uh, Senator Bolden, you have Senate File 926. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. We are going to stay on the topic of mental health care. Um, I, I do have an amendment for this bill as well. I would move the A1. Madam Chair. And looking in my documents, Senator Bold, <clears throat> excuse me, Senator Bolden moves the A1 amendment. Just trying to find the right. And this is the first stop, um, the author's amendment. Um, Senator Bolden, Bolden moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is adopted. Thank you, the Madam. amendment is adopted. So, Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll just note that the author's amendment um, would in, uh, make it clear that we are including MCOs in this proposed rate bridge. Um, it makes that clear and sets up the MCO's abilities to pass the rate increase through to providers. So um, that was the amendment. As we all know well, we are in a crisis in access to mental health care, as we have been discussing uh, today and previously. Senate File 926 responds to the foundational need to build our mental health care system by increasing Medicaid reimbursement for outpatient mental health and substance use services. The language establishes a 35% rate bridge in anticipation of implementation of a new outpatient rate structure that is currently being studied by DHS. 
Medicaid is the primary payer for the majority of our state's mental health care and substance use disorder services system. By design, the rate bridge is a necessary and temporary fix. Without an immediate solution, we re remain at great risk of continuing on our current path with ever decreasing access to mental health care and substance use treatments, jeopardizing Minnesotans' residents' mental health and well being. Included in your packets are findings fr from provider surveys conducted in 2019, 2021, and again in 2023. The survey's analyses compare the gap between costs to deliver care and Medicaid reimbursement rates. We see a grave and growing chasm, with an average of 40% difference between the costs of providing services and reimbursement rates. Broken and unsustainable rates are directly related to months-long waiting lists, schools lacking the presence of school-linked mental health professionals, hospital emergency departments inundated with mental health needs, and increasingly complex clients at every level of our continuum. Community-based providers serving primarily our Medicaid enrollees are simply unable to meet basic salary expectations for all staff roles. Without the ability to hire, train, support, and retain talented mental health care staff, we cannot meet communities' mental health care needs. Mental health care requires talented staff. Without staff, our effective treatments cannot be tapped. In-home services for families, evidence-based practices for complex care, simply timely access to a consistent provider is not possible if we don't address today's mental health care rates. Our community-based mental health care providers are operating underwater, dependent on philanthropy, and unable to compensate staff as needed. Providers statewide have been implementing creative solutions and remain increasingly challenged to serve clients and continue operations as creative solutions cannot substitute for rates that pay for the cost of care. Collectively, the absence of viable rates hurts our providers, our partners, our state budget, and most importantly, it hurts Minnesotans. Mental health treatment can make a world of difference, but too often today Minnesotans find they cannot access timely quality care and so instead are in a world of hurt. I wanna thank my co-authors, including Senator Abler, um, for signing on to this critical piece of legislation and uh, with that, Madam Chair would move to testifiers. Thank you, Senator Bolden. Um, we have Julie Hannenberg. Please um, state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you. Julie Hannenberg, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I am the founder and executive director of Lighthouse Child and Family Services. We serve a seven county rural area in central Minnesota. I am speaking today on behalf of the mental health provider community and it is supported by the Mental Health Legislative Network. Low mental health reimbursement rates in the state of Minnesota have real consequences. We have the potential to employ 27 therapists and have eight positions, which is 30% of our therapy roles currently unstaffed. Graduates are choosing to not work in the mental health field and are exiting this industry because our rate structure doesn't compensate a livable wage, especially relative to the education and cost of supervision hours required. At Lighthouse, we have wait lists of more than 20 people weekly, and it takes six to eight weeks to get in for services. Unfortunately, a harsh reality of these wait lists is people have died by suicide while waiting. A young mother, we'll call her Anna, recently called needing therapy for herself and her 14-month-old son. Two weeks ago when she was grocery shopping, her boyfriend overdosed on heroin while parenting their son. Her son was involved in every part of this tragedy at 14 months old. With the neighbors trying to resuscitate his dad, the ambulance arriving with sirens, all parts of his dad's traumatic death. When Anna called, our wait list was 10 weeks out. Anna was distraught, saying she couldn't wait that long. She was scared, afraid of relapsing to drug use, and worried about putting her son at risk. She needs help to support her grieving son. He wakes up crying every night and has been wandering around the apartment during the day searching for his dad. If we were fully, fully funded and fully staffed, we could help Anna and her son within the same week. We could get support for her sobriety, her grieving, and begin building deeper support systems. We would provide in-home evidence-based therapies for this family and help Anna learn to read her son's cues and respond in a healthy way to return him to a typical development, re development trajectory. Instead, due to our broken rates, the burden is on Anna. She needs to drive 40 miles to get to an outpatient office. She needs to keep a series of appointments while also living in her own grief. Sadly, we have had too, far too many Annas who desperately need services to help manage their trauma, and we're not able to help them in their time of need. 
Due to, the, due to the upside down pay structure for children's services, we have halted all our in-home skills programs because we cannot pay a wage higher than area retail or fast food. This work is specialized and require high level skills. We need people who are well enough themselves to confidently go into families' homes to listen to, advise, and support parents, and who can manage their own distress when working with children who have behavioral outbursts. Many of the families we serve are involved in the child protection system. Our families experience physical abuse, neglect, sexual abuse, significant substance abuse issues, and are still reeling from COVID and our crisis of racial inequity. In short, our families are complex. We support their healing, parenting, and help instill hope for the future. This work requires tenured, capable ten me team members. The trauma our staff hold on a daily basis is exhausting. They need support and a break. But due to our rates, too often they instead need to take a side job to make ends meet. Currently, mental health services has not received a rate increase in 11 years. We desperately need funding to respond to the great needs throughout Minnesota. With the rate increase for our mental health system, we can build needed capacity to serve all the children, youth, families, and individuals who deserve the opportunity to heal, grow, and live into their best futures. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, next, uh, we have um, Ms. Dallas. Would you like to testify on this bill as well? Please again state your name for the record and begin. Um, you are yes, there. Thank you. Yep. Ashley Dallas. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, I would like to uh, offer testimony. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to offer testimony in support of this bill. Um, as I stated before, I'm the Director of Clinical Services at Family Service Rochester. We are a nonprofit agency and uh, in our mission, we serve everybody um, regardless of their ability to pay. So ac accessible and affordable services are um, in our fabric. Uh, we do the we do this through um, offering a sliding fee and accepting all insurances, including Medicaid. Forty seven percent percent of our clients qualify to receive a sliding fee. Uh, we uh, have seen in this time our therapists moving into private practice or outside of the agency with the. Um, the commentary of wanting to make more money um, to be able to meet the, the growing uh, expenses in their lives. We are seeing uh, in those, we know in those private practice um, environments, there are often limits to how many clients are served to have uh, Medicaid or MA coverage um, to be able to achieve that competitive salary. In an already sparse workforce, it is exceedingly challenging to maintain serving the clientele we are committed to, often leaving the most vulnerable without services or waiting for those medically necessary services. The low and unchanging MA rates are not keeping up with expenses, including offering those competitive wages to our therapists. Uh, the impact to us um, has been uh, annual losses in our mental health service line. Um, if our mental health services were a standalone business, we would not be in business and the clients that we receive would be without care. We are fortunate to have other programming to help sustain our mental health work, even when we operate as a at a loss in that area. The impact of this rate uh, bill would be significant to our agency and the communities that we serve. It would provide us the opportunity to increase our therapist salaries, retain staff, and lower our wait lists, um, and ultimately serve more people. Thank you. Thank you very much again for your, your testimony tonight. Um, members, any questions or comments? Um, Senator Bolden, any, any final comments? 
I would just say, Madam Chair, that we know we are at a crisis point in terms of mental health care across our state. And in talking with um, providers, uh, it was clear their message to me was this is perhaps the most important thing we could do to improve access to mental health care for folks uh, where we know it is desperately needed. So would appreciate member support. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it does seem, um, seem like a critical need and um, to hear that there are people who graduate and who choose not to go into the field, that's, um, that's really um, crushing if, if we could have more people entering positions. So um, thank you again for your testimony. And, and this bill, um, Senate File 926, will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Next, next we are... Uh, we will turn to Senator Morrison, who is with us uh, virtually tonight. And the first bill, Senator Morrison, we're going to take up is Senate File 2923. And we have an amendment that's being passed out right now. Senator Morrison, Thank go ahead. You. Um, you have this amendment. I believe it's an author's amendment. That's right, Madam Chair. I'm just looking through my materials to find the bill that we're working on. So, um, Senator Morrison moves the A1 am author's amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. And aye. opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Morrison, please go ahead and present your bill. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, members, as an obstetrician myself who's seen the power and impact of doulas in action, I am thrilled to offer uh, Senate File 2923, uh, which I think is a really important piece of legislation which aims to increase access to doula care for Medicaid-eligible pregnant and birthing people. It also addresses the importance of providing MA reimbursement rates that allow doulas to provide services to individuals without seeking additional funding to cover their costs. Doulas are trained non-medical professionals who provide continuous physical, emotional, and informational support to mothers and families during their pregnancy, labor, and postpartum period. The doula's goal is to help them achieve the healthiest outcomes for birthing people, moms, and babies. We've had evidence for years that access to doula services for our neighbors on Medicaid can improve outcomes, lead to a more satisfying birthing experience, and save state Medicaid dollars. We do have two superstar researchers here in Minnesota, Drs. Kazamanel and Hardeman, um, and they've written um, papers about doula care. Um, and in one study that looked at Medicaid-funded births regionally, they wrote that women who received doula support had lower preterm and cesarean birth rates than Medicaid beneficiaries regionally. They found that doula-supported births in 73% of Medicaid-funded births um, regionally resulted in cost savings of $58.4 million and averted 3,288 preterm births. Uh, during listening sessions held by DHS um, with Black Minnesotans and other stakeholders to build equity into Minnesota's Medicaid services, doula care was raised as an important strategy to increase access to culturally relevant care. Um, Community-based doulas are particularly well suited to improve racial disparities and health outcomes by ensuring that pregnant people who face the greatest risk of discrimination and mistreatment in the medical system receive the additional support that they require. The strong doula client relationship is grounded in trust and shared experience and ultimately makes the overall pregnancy and birthing experience more positive. So I think it's important to improve access to doula care because it could improve the health of our community and decrease costs for the state. Um, and with that, Madam Chair, I will turn it over to my testifier to share um, their experience as a doula and why this bill is so important to pass. Thank you, Senator Morrison. Um, and um, to the first testifier, um, Ad and I will try Ade Salami. You got it right. Great. Uh, please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. 
My name is Ade Salami. Good evening. Uh, hello, Chair Wickland and members of the committee. Uh, again, my name is Ade Salami. I am the co-founder of a, a doula collective named a BA Collective, and I am also a birth and postpartum doula. Uh, I'm here to testify in support of Senate File 2923, and I would be remiss if it, I did not take the opportunity to acknowledge that today is the first day of World Doula Week. So very fitting to have this hearing today. Um, there are a lot of benefits to doula services. Doulas not only assist birthing people through birthing and delivery process, but we provide individualized education about childbirth for expecting parents and people who need help minimizing their fear and anxiety in healthcare systems. We help create support networks, and above all, we provide care and comfort during the birthing experience and promote the birthing person's wishes about their labor and delivery experience. Um, from an equity standpoint, it is particularly important to note that black and indigenous women are over twice as likely to experience an unplanned cesarean birth, and they are more likely to die from birth complications. Doula services are shown to improve health outcomes for both the birthing person and their babies, as they're less likely to experience cesarean sections or other health interventions and are more likely to have their baby full term. Not only can a doula service save lives, but it does, again, help cut costs to, by avoiding expensive complications. A preterm birth in Minnesota typically costs about $50,000, and that is more than a full-term birth. Uh, birth complications such as cesareans exponentially are more expensive than a natural vaginal delivery, and that is also going to help with investing in the prenatal and preventative care and services that we can offer our birthing people. Um, Medicaid reimbursement late rates are very low, and many doulas are discouraged from taking patients that are on medical assistance due to that. I think it's important to note that Medicaid currently covers about 40% of the births in the state of Minnesota, and that currently, um, the current legislation currently limits the amount that doulas can receive to $47 per visit and $770 for a birth. Um, Using my own business as an example, a BA collective makes a concerted effort to be affordable, but even with our services ranging from $900 to $1,800, the current reimbursement rate would not allow a client to take advantage of our services. Uh, doulas who are privately paid generally charge at minimum twice as much as a client is currently going to be reimbursed, and that is more than most families, particularly our black and brown families on Medicaid, can afford. Um, those disproportionately disadvantaged communities of color are the people that stand to benefit the most from this care and the comfort and advocacies that doulas can ultimately provide. And I think it's important to understand that increasing this reimbursement is a step in the right direction to make sure that every Minnesotan that wants a doula can have one. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, next on, I have Susan Abdallah Lane and Aronica Jackson. Hi. Hi. Please state Thank your you, name. Madam Chair, for uh, the opportunity to be here. Um, Aronica will not be here this evening. She has um, got COVID. So, <laughs> um, I'm a board, my name is Susan Lane. I am a board member of Everyday Miracles, an organization that for a number of years has been providing doula care to low income women in our community. Um, at this uh, at this point in time, we have um, 91 doulas working at Everyday Miracles. 70% of them are women of color. And we serve over 400 clients a year, but we turn away 25 to 30 clients a month, more than we are actually able to serve because all of our doulas must have other jobs, other employment, and are unable to provide this care that they are so well trained to provide and that offers the benefits that you, that have been described to you by, by Senator Morrison. Um, this bill would provide basically after the expenses that are involved in doula care for a contractor, uh, that, which is a way we provide our services, it would provide an entry level wage um, for the doulas who are serving Medicaid families it's been 17 years since this body became the first in the country to make doula care a right for families, something that we have been very proud of in our doula community. And we have since then had great support um, 
from this body for, for making doula care available, but we would really like now to make it um, a, f a reality for many more women and particularly those who will benefit most. Um, there are presently 17 states working on legislation similar to this. There are doulas working all over the world, but again, in Minnesota, we do not have access for the women who need it most at the rate that it is needed. Um, so we would like not to be turning away these families anymore. And I really thank you very much for your support in the past. Um, Senator Mann, I think, was uh, on our last bill, and Senator Abler has been a supporter of ours since 2003. So I'm grateful to all of you for for the help that you've given, and thank you again for the opportunity to um, be here. Thank you very much. Members, um, any questions or comments about the bill? Senator Abler. Well, thanks, Madam Chair. I'm glad I got back in time for this, so uh, nice to see you again. And It's such a great uh, program. I do actually have one question that I realize I don't know the answer. Um, part of the benefit in the past has been where at least the doula would know the family and the woman and so on. Uh, is it still true? Do you still get to, is there like a dial a doula? I mean, you pick a random one or is it, do you get to stay with the one that, with the family that you've gotten to know? Um, do you want to answer? Uh, I can so answer for my perspective. Yes, we do uh, get to know our clients. And so we highly encourage dating doulas. It is important to extend that sense of safety and comfort. And that is part of building a relationship. Yeah. Senator Abel. Well, I'm just glad to hear about it, and, you know, hopefully this is enough to draw more people in, and it's just, I mean, it's, it's just such a great thing, you know. Um, uh, we've had six kids, and six or five were at home, and one was uh, in a hospital, but um, it's just nice to have the, the care person that you know and that understands you and understands the, the pregnant, you know, delivering mom and just what she might need and the reassurances and then it goes like twice as good anyway that way it seems like so happy to see it thank you madam chair thank it's you not too late for you to become a doula senator abler <laughs> <laughs> any other member questions or comments uh, senator morrison do you have any final final comments about your bill uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members, and thanks to the testifiers. They couldn't have sold the bill better. Um, this is just a really common sense, evidence-based approach to improve birth outcomes in Minnesota. So uh, I hope to have committee support. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Morrison. Seeing no other questions, thank you for bringing this forward. Thank you, testifiers. Um, it does seem like a very strong strategy, and um, it does seem like an area that we should be addressing addressing these rates. So uh, with that, Senate file 2923 as amended will be laid over. Next, Senator Morrison, you have uh, Senate file 1951. Yes, Madam Chair, and I do have an amendment too. And I believe the A1 amendment And we're just looking through our papers here to find. And Madam Chair, the, the amendment is um, just reflects technical assistance from DHS. Members, have you all located the A1 amendment? Um, Senator Morrison moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. The amendment is adopted. Senator Morrison, please present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first, I want to thank my um, all-star co-authors of Abler, Wickland, Hoffman, and Dietzik. Um, but I'm pleased to present uh, Senate File 1951. Um, this bill has come before uh, the Committee of Both Bodies several times since 2018. Uh, in 2021, 
uh, this committee and the legislature directed DHS to convene a stakeholder group to design what recuperative care should look like in Minnesota. And this bill is reflective of the work of this broad group of stakeholders. Recuperative care is a national model. It provides short-term care for those who are not ill enough to be in a hospital, yet too ill to recuperate on the streets. Recuperative care is usually a partnership where medical staff from a healthcare provider provide limited care in a shelter setting. In Minnesota, the few programs that exist are paid through a patchwork of funding. The bill before you directs Minnesota to pay for recuperative care through Medicaid. This will include care coordination, basic nursing care, community health workers, and behavioral health support, and provides some reimbursement for housing through the state. Recuperative care is one lever to help address hospital discharge challenges and overcrowding. The estimated daily cost in the hospital when a patient doesn't need to be there is $2,500 a day, compared to about $350 a day for recuperative care. One day in the hospital when it's not needed could pay for an entire week of recuperative care. The data here and around the country is clear on the savings and we are confident that the report to the legislature will quantify these savings clearly, which is part of the amendment that we just adopted. And members with that, I'd like to turn it to the testifiers. Thank you, Senator Morrison. Um, now I have Dr. Laurel Reese, and if you can state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Laurel Reese. I'm a family physician, and I'm the president-elect of the Minnesota Medical Association, and I'm speaking on behalf of our 10,000 physician members and um, physician in training as well, um, in strong support of SF. 1951. Um, so much of what happens outside of our clinics and hospitals impact the health status of our Minnesotans. Um, housing insecurity and homelessness is one of the issues that's a major social determinant of health. About 20,000 people in Minnesota are unhoused every year, nearly half of them children. For most people discharged from a hospital, recovery takes place at home under the watchful eye of caregivers and others charged with their care. But for a person who doesn't have a home, recovery following discharge from the hospital is difficult, challenging. For these patients, recovery on the streets isn't an option. Patients experiencing homelessness are twice as likely to be readmitted to the hospital within one week of discharge and are more likely to be admitted to the hospital for high risk and very costly conditions. In addition, patients experiencing homelessness are at risk for earlier death, significantly so, compared to those who have stable housing. To ensure that Minnesotans experiencing homelessness can receive needed short-term care, in their recovery following hospitalization. The Minnesota Medical Association is in strong support of expanding medical assistance coverage to include recuperative care, something that this bill will help accomplish. Providing these individuals experiencing homelessness with recuperative care results in improved health outcomes, increased appropriate access to care, reduced emergency department visits, um, decreased use of detox centers, and also decreased inappropriate use of criminal justice system as an alternatives to both behavioral health and shelter systems. Um, in addition, it gives people compassionate care. On behalf of our state's physicians, I urge you to support this important bill that will work to protect some of Minnesota's most vulnerable residents. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. And now I have Amy Gordon. Uh, can you please state your name for the record and begin your testimony? Amy Gordon. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Dr. Amy Gordon, nurse practitioner with Hennepin County Healthcare for the Homeless. Thank you, Senator Morrison, for once again authoring this bill. Healthcare for the Homeless is a shelter and outreach based federally qualified healthcare center which provides physical and mental health care to individuals experiencing homelessness. One embedded program Healthcare for the Homeless provides is medical recuperative care in partnership with Catholic Charities. Imagine the last time you were sick, broke a bone, or were recovering from a surgery or hospitalization. Now imagine doing that with no place to sleep, no running water or toilet access, limited food resources, or while carrying your possessions. Would you have been able to heal, or would you likely have gotten worse? 
In the Healthcare for the Homeless Recuperative Care Program, we provide essential services to support the rest and recovery from immediate health concerns like pneumonia, jaw fracture, finger amputation, or exacerbations of chronic health conditions like congestive heart failure or a diabetic foot ulcer. The care we provide shows a reduction of higher level services being accessed and allows our clients to get their health and social service needs back on track. Currently, this type of care either goes unpaid or is paid by a hodgepodge of health systems, foundations, grants, or donations. Here is how services will change across the state of Minnesota when recuperative care is paid for by medical assistance. We will be able to provide care coordination, behavioral health support, basic nursing care, and partner with community health workers. These are all critical pieces to helping an individual heal physically and mentally so they can stabilize their lives and see a brighter future. Here is a brief audio testimony of a current client, Mr. Uh, Jewel Cook Jr., who has benefited from our current services, which calls out the need for steady funding so health systems and housing settings can have the infrastructure needed to establish recuperative care programs. He was not able to attend tonight, and Zoom from shelter is not an option. Hi, my name is Jewel Cook Jr. I come to Endeavor's recuperative care after hernia surgery. The services at Respite have really helped me to clear my mind to get stabilization. I had think time. I was able to get stabilization on my own. I improved my health 100%. If I wasn't able to come here, I wouldn't have the thought process to move forward to get my own housing. Just in a short period of time, I was able to get my own place and will be leaving Endeavor shortly. I believe the respite care could help change a lot of homeless people's lives by giving them the time and no worries about a place to stay, shower, food, eat, clear their mind. It is a very necessary program. There are other stories in your packet as well um, that you please feel free to read. I strongly encourage you to pass this bill. It is common sense and we know what to do to step into this healthcare gap. We cannot wait another year to establish this service when there are people right now who desperately need it. Thank you. And I thank you for your testimony, and thank you for playing the audio testimony as well. Um, I have two other names, Tracy and Tatiana. 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 So please um, state, your, state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you. Madam Chair and committee members, my name is Tatiana Finkley. I am the Senior Program Manager for Medical Respite with our Catholic Charities Higher Ground St. Paul location. Um, I am here today because Amy has said enough about what recuperative care is. I wanted to share the two stories of individuals who are not here to share their testimony with us. Um, my first story is about PR. PR came to us from Regions Hospital diagnosed with terminal cancer. Um, he went through chemotherapy and we had two options for him. He worked very closely with our case manager and housing navigator to either find housing and there was collaboration with a local church that offered to pay six months of his housing cost until he was able to get back on his feet. And the alternative was if his chemo was unsuccessful, that church would then provide him with a ticket back to El Salvador. On July 24th, he found out that his chemo was unsuccessful, and I remember he passed me in the hallway and asked, could, he, could I extend his stay an additional four days until his flight? This was not an issue. I absolutely wanted him to stay. He was able to successfully go back home and pass away two weeks later with dignity with the people that he loved instead of dying in shelter or in a hospital or on the street. So without the help of our housing navigator and case manager, he would have had a very different, different story. My other story is about RD, who also came to us with terminal cancer. He, he worked with the hospice team, and I remember the day that he was getting close to discharge and his hospice team 
told me that they were going to buy him a tent because he lost his housing prior to coming to respite because his unit was condemned and he didn't feel comfortable in shelter. Instead, my team and I worked tirelessly to find him housing in Catholic Charities St. Anthony residence, and he was able to live many, many months beyond what we originally thought that he would. He was able to take the many walks that he enjoyed taking with his friends in downtown St. Paul Parks, and he eventually passed on again a very dignified death versus dying in a tent in downtown St. Paul as he originally thought that he would. As Amy said, this bill is common sense. We do the work. I'm here as an individual who does the work every single day. My team operates seven days a week. Passing Senate File 1951 would create sustainable funding for this program to ensure that we can continue this work and have more of these success stories versus some of the alternate stories that one may hear um, from shelter and individuals experiencing homelessness. Thank you for listening and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, I have a Tracy G listed. She's not, okay. She was unable to come. Okay. Um, Senate uh, members, do you have any questions or comments about the bill? No questions. Uh, Senator Morrison, any um, closing comments about your bill? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to thank the testifiers um, for being here and providing the testimony. And um, this is just a common sense, really important measure that I, that I hope that uh, we're able to conclude in the end. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Senator Morrison, and thank you to all the testifiers. Um, you really did give us, uh, you know, a, a great idea of what the service is providing or, and and the value um, in putting um, putting forward the actions of the bill. So thank you very much for your time tonight. And with that, um, Senate File 1951 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Senator Morrison, um, next we have Senate File 770. Uh, uh, we have an amendment that's being distributed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I was going to say I have an amendment. Senator Morrison moves um, the A2 amendment. Does everybody have? Oh. I think I, it's an A1, not in true. Oh, okay. Uh, members, some of us received the correct amendment and some did not, so we'll, we'll get the correct amendment out. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Robert's looking at it. The A, I believe it's the A1, but it's just correcting a drafting error. Um, it's the A2 amendment. Senator Morrison moves the A2 okay. author's amendment. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? The amendment is adopted. <coughs> Senator Morrison, please go ahead and present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senate file. 770 would is a very simple bill. It, it would provide a long overdue rate increase for Minnesota psychologists doing critical access mental health care. Um, in 2007, the legislature passed a major mental health reform bill. Psychiatrists and advanced practice nurses in psychiatry were given a 23.7 rate increase for critical access patient care. Um, this bill would correct the error of leaving psychologists out and would be a small but solid first step toward, toward paying Minnesota psychologists what's needed to attract, continue to attract people to the profession. 
our shortage of psychologists is a big um, contributor to our, an exacerbator of our mental health crisis. Um, and with that, Madam Chair, I do have a testifier from the Minnesota Psychological Association. I believe he's here. Uh, yes, um, Dr. Girardeau, or, um, please uh, state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Uh, Stephen Girardeau, uh, psychologist, and thank you, Madam Chair, members, for hearing my testimony today. I'm here obviously in support of the bill because it's the bill I want to have move forward. Um, I'm here to t talk about psych psychology in America. Um, we don't have enough psychologists in America currently and we're having fewer going in than, and we have more going out. Uh, you'll notice my gray hair. Uh, this is kind of what psychologists look like in America today because we're, we're tending to be gray haired and we're tending to get ready towards retirement. Um, a couple of key facts, I think the first thing I just want to call attention to is the graph in the middle of the page, which is talking about the increase in the cost of a doctoral education um, from 1999 to today. Uh, 65,600 was what it was in 1999, and 147.3 was when it is not what it is now. Um, that isn't even the real whole story. Uh, I feel very privileged because I actually went and got my undergraduate at a time when you could still get an undergraduate degree and pay for the degree and your living expenses all on part-time work. I mean, you have, you have student jobs and things like that, and you can actually kind of pay for things as you were going along, and it's nowhere near that now. It's real common for, peop for people to come out of uh, their education with $200,000 of debt which is a mortgage on top of everything else. And also, the, but on top of that, we have the rates that aren't really rising at all. Um, <clears throat> we have a high level of training, which is very different from master's level training. I actually was uh, a master's level psychologist. I was grandfathered in. I have gray hair, but I wasn't gray when I was grandfathered in. But I went back to school and got my doctorate, and I know a whole lot more and do a whole lot better job. Um, with the additional education. And so those additional four years made a huge difference in what I'm able to do. One of the great ironies of mental health, though, is that Medicaid and Medicare pay the least for services, and they don't really uh, pay, pay enough for the cover, to cover the cost for it. But also, they have the most complex cases. And so underfunding Medicaid for, for psychologists basically takes the best qualified people to work with the most complex cases out of the picture because they're not able to take, not able to work for that kind of money. Um, while we are paid a percentage more, that percentage is not anywhere near what it needs to be. Um, the uh, income uh, in 2001, the median salary for a doctoral level of psychologist was $72,000. Uh, 20 years later, it's only 82. During that same period, uh, of time, inflation, um, just straight regular inflation, went up 53%, remembering that the cost of an education went up a whole lot more, 125%, and the cost of living has also dr driven up quite a bit. Um, using, the, using the Minnesota Federal Reserve uh, inflation calculator, the rate that should have been would be 110. If you use a different rate, uh, it should be like $128,000 is, is for what it would be if you just inflated $72,000. Um, so we've basically taken a one-third or more pay cut over the last 20 years. And this is not the same for master's level clinicians. If you look at the same data for those clinicians, they've not stayed with inflation, but they're nowhere near as far away as, as the psychologists are. Um, and so what's happened is, is that we basically have been underpaying psychologists for a long time. And what happens is that psychologists move into private practice and in private practice, they can make uh, a lot more money, and, the, and that has really changed the dynamic quite a bit. I testified in the House uh, about two weeks ago about this bill, and serendipitously, the day before I got, uh, was testified, I got an email in which one of the uh, Canvas Health was offering $10,000 retention bonus for a psychologist to stay on. And then serendipitously, literally today, uh, with venture capitalism coming into mental health, got an email that was basically talking about uh, one of these entities called BetterHelp offering $101,000 to $135,000 a year on 1099 salary. So it's not, it, it's not employment. You have to pay yourself em self-employment taxes. But that's for master's level clinicians. It's not just psychologists. 
the marketplace is pricing people out of getting their doctorates. And we cannot, I don't think we can really do well as a society if we don't have doctoral level psychology available. But if we don't pay for people to get the education and support the educational debt that they carry, there's just no way to move forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony and for the, the handout. Uh, Mr. Amberg, did you have testimony or just for questions? Members, do you have any questions or comments? Senator Abler. Yeah, not to disappoint, Madam Chair. Um, so just to, the whole big picture, I mean, this is a kind of a you know, grim story here. And, but then you, you think about what we're, that's the part we have in charge of is the, the health care for people who are of very modest means and you know, all kinds of equity issues. And, and so it, in many cases, you can't, if they, they're, you know, the psychologists are one group, the dentists often work below cost. At our clinic, it's marginal money, it's something, but it, it doesn't, you can't make a living on it. You have to have other kind of work to subsidize this. And so, I mean, there's an endless parade of individuals, of groups that need money, and they're not kidding. Because uh, over the years, we've been doing other things with our money. The targets have not been, you know, $17 billion to spend, but they've been three or four for the whole industry. And so um, it's not for lack of interest they're trying. So just to stick up for the whole idea. And so, but just to remember that people who have, who are better healed have a much, have an opportunity to go someplace where they are able to pay the going rate with their insurance and so on. And so, and we, I mean, in dentistry, it's to the point you can't find an appointment. I don't know how it is with psychology, but it's, um, hopefully you're still doing it, but we want our, our, our clients, I guess you call them, to be able to access this important care. So I'm just putting a plug for the, the whole idea. So thanks for coming. And, you know, you have to make a lot of decisions, Madam Chair. So if you need any help with those, I'll be happy to mark up your bill and give you that day off. If you want. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> uh, members, any other questions or comments? Um, not seeing any other, I think it is critical that we do look at these, look at rates. Um, we need to have people who can afford to get the education they need and, and then be able to move into jobs that pay them well enough. Um, and I certainly understand we want to have people working at different levels of practice and different, different levels of expertise. Uh, Senator Morrison, any other um, comments about your bill, final comments? I think you said it well, Madam Chair. Thank you. I appreciate your consideration of this bill. You know, we are in the middle of a mental health crisis and we have to continue to build our um, workforce of psychologists. And this was left out in 2007, a long time ago. So this is a great opportunity to fix that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Senator Morrison. And um, Senate File 770 will be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Next, Senator Morrison, you have Senate File 1174. Yes, Madam Chair, and I uh, also... We a, yes, we have an amendment that's being passed out. Thank you. Looking for my copy here. It looks like this is a delete everything amend amendment, Senator Morrison. Uh, I don't know if it's technically a delete everything, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, it. But it's I don't have a delete everything. Um, okay. So, Senator no, Morrison, sure what I meant to say is, it's a delete everything. <laughs> Um, Senator Morrison moves the A1 author's amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Morrison, please present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the Senate file 1174 is legislation that builds Minnesota's family-centered children's mental health continuum. Today, too many kids and families in Minnesota are waiting months for needed mental health care or not accessing care at all. 
without support, too many children first gain mental health care due to a crisis and end up needing the highest level of care hospitalization, where many children experience the trauma of boarding in an emergency room. Providing access to treatment earlier is more effective. This proposal comes from the Mental Health Legislative Network, and it reflects the top priorities for children's mental health care with goals to break down barriers and urgently build needed mental health services. The values driving this proposal are maximizing existing Medicaid benefits to support children and families with services and supports we have today of critical importance as we design immediate responses within a landscape that's limited by staff and financial resources. Supporting early intervention as with timely responses, children do better and can prevent the need for additional interventions. Building on what is proven and works for children and families, focusing on family supports to honor family voices and needs to support the child and enhance the skills and abilities of the family, to help the child through treatment and to achieve well-being in the community. And finally, sustaining and building a family-centered continuum. Building services must center on the greatest needs of children and families. And this proposal exemplifies our opportunity to develop service designs that are what families want and need to effectively help kids. Um, I just want to briefly go over some of the key provisions that are included in the bill, because we are calling it sort of the children's mental health minibus. Um, solutions for children boarding. Uh, so with mental health innovation and transition to community grants for children to transition from boarding to community care, increase PCA wages when serving a child with high aggression, funding the third path for children to access residential treatment, building new psychiatric residential treatment facility capacity, and then improving access to care by increasing respite access for families, enhanced training and compensation for youth and family peer specialists, building teams for intensive in-home models with increased compensation and access to training, expanded children's clinical consultation for coordination of teams caring for children and families, establishing rural family response and stabilization, supporting a Minnesota best practice collaborative intensive bridge, bridging service, to expand um, through inclusion in our state plan, creating a children's design for non-emergency medical transportation, and then funding current models, so school-linked and intermediate schools behavioral health grants, shelter-linked behavioral health grants, and early childhood mental health service grants, and then lastly, supporting families and youth by honoring families seeking care for their children by not involving child protection when family relies on hospital care to keep the child safe, providing child care for parents on MFib with mental illness to access treatment, supporting young people to maintain their youth ACT team into young adulthood, and allowing youth age 16 and up to consent for outpatient mental health treatment. I do have two testifiers to share more about the value of this value of this bill, but overall, Madam Chair and members, this is about getting the kids that need access the most as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Morrison. Um, yes, we have uh, Shannon Brown and um, Sarah Drusten. Uh, please state your name for the record and then begin your testimony. Hello, my name is Shannon Brown and I'm the CEO at Fernbrook Family Center. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to Senate File 1174. Fernbrook Family Center provides in-home services, early childhood mental health, and school-linked mental health services across Southeast Minnesota in nine counties. In my 12 years doing this work, I've seen all of these programs have profound impacts on the kids and families that we serve. A majority of the clients we serve at Fernbrook have multiple barriers they face when trying to access mental health services. They may be 45 miles from the nearest provider. Many are single parent families with multiple children under the age of six and do not have safe and consistent child care that is affordable. The caregivers struggle with their own mental health issues. Their employers do not allow them to take two to three hours off work weekly to take their child to therapy. They have insurance but can't afford the $5,000 deductible and then $40 per session copay thereafter, and they do not have reliable transportation. The list goes on and on. 
Programs outlined in Senate File 1174 are essential if kids and families are going to access mental health services. They directly address the barriers that I previously outlined. I want to specifically share a story about the impact of in-home work since this is what Fernbrick was founded on 22 years ago. One parent recently shared that prior to receiving in-home mental health services for their daughter, the police had been called to their house weekly, often multiple times per week. The nine-year-old was adopted and had experienced being held at gunpoint, sexual abuse, and neglect for the first three years of their life. They had tried several outpatient therapists and the child would refuse to get out of the car, would destroy the therapist's office, and would refuse to participate. The parents could not manage the child's behaviors and could not keep others in the home safe and were often scared and had to call law enforcement to assist. The child would hit, kick, throw things, and try to run away. Police would transport to the emergency department where they would attempt to stabilize them and send her back home. The parents were fearful of this child hurting them, herself, or the younger children in the home. Through in-home services, we were able to identify triggers, create safety plans, coach caregivers on how to respond to the safety concerns, and build relationships between the family members so healing from trauma could happen. This caregiver shared that police have not been called in several months and the family was able to go on a small family vacation recently without fear of what would happen. Additionally, the additional funding for school-linked mental health, early childhood mental health, and in-home service care coordination, and the others outlined in Senate File 1174 will continue to allow us to intervene quickly, efficiently, and proactively. The funding will allow us to prepare our staff for the work they will be doing through additional training, the funding will also help us all work together to keep kids out of the hospital, out of the juvenile justice system, and off the streets. The funding will allow us to continue and expand the work that we know works with kids and families in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Dearson, please um, state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Dr. Sarah Jersted. I am a psychologist and the medical director of outpatient mental health services at Children's Minnesota. I appreciate you having me here today to express our support for Senate File 1174. Children in our state are in the midst of a mental health crisis, which has led many families to seek care for their child in a hospital emergency department. Often these kids do not need hospital level care, but there are not spaces available in the community, residential, or home settings. Kids therefore end up boarding or waiting in hospitals sometimes weeks or even months for space to open up at the right care setting. A 2022 DHS survey found that 12% of kids presenting with mental health needs ended up boarding in a hospital, with 65% of them staying in the emergency department. We know this is not the environment these children need to heal. It's because of this that I'm here in support of this bill. Children's Minnesota continues to expand our continuum of mental health care to include more acute mental health services. In 2022, we opened our first inpatient mental health unit, and earlier this year, we opened a second partial hospitalization program. These services are important but more must be done to build a comprehensive children's mental health system that ensures that kids can receive the right level of care in the right setting when they need it. There are many pieces of this bill that we support, but I want to name a few in particular. First, improving the Mental Health Innovation Grant Program will help fund the development of placement options for children boarding in hospitals. In addition, it's important we also provide increased reimbursement for personal care attendants who serve children with high aggression. These kids are the ones most likely to be boarding at our hospital. Investments in respite care are also urgently needed, especially for children and families who've utilized crisis services, emergency room services, or experienced loss of in-home staffing support. Finally, improvements to our non-emergency medical transport services are long overdue. For too long, children have been served by systems that aren't designed for their specific needs. When kids need access to non-emergency transport vehicle services, they should be able to access these services that are designed for them. When children need access to mental health care, they should be able to access a variety of services to meet their needs, whether it be at school, home, or in the health care setting. And this bill gives us the tools we need to serve kids better, and we should pass it this year. Thank you. Senator Morrison for recognizing this urgent need. 
Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Members, any questions? Senator Atkey. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, for either Senator Morrison or the testifiers, if they win. But I'm looking at the amendment, uh, page 5, line 8, where it starts. And it references, counties must work to provide access to regularly scheduled respite care. How does, because that's spelled out, how would that differ from what they currently do? And, uh, you know, I guess as you, we look at that and we always hear about the mandates and such, just wondering where this is going to fall into line with uh, what they would normally carry, carry out. Senator Morrison, do you have? Madam That's Chair and Senator Ucky, I would defer to um, one of the experts who's doing this work on the ground. Um, I see another um, expert approaching. Um, go ahead and introduce yourself. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Kirsten Anderson. I'm with Aspire Minnesota and uh, really honored to be with you today talking about this really important proposal. Uh, Senator Aki, I am not super familiar with this section and um, I believe that, that the respite grants are administered by the counties. It's already an established county program. So I think this is simply re-articulating that that is the goal of this grant program. Senator Aki. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And just to, for clarity, this, they typically in most cases or all cases are already doing this. It's just letting them know that it's expected. Uh, Ms. Anderson. Madam Chair, Senator Aki, that is my understanding. Yeah, there has been um, quite, discuss quite a lot of discussion over these last months and years about the importance of expanding this program to provide more respite for families. I'll also say that that enhanced respite as a national trend has been uh, increased rec increasingly recognized as a strategy that helps children stay out of hospitalization, prevent uh, residential treatment and a whole wide range of, of other enhanced treatments because families simply get an opportunity to take a giant inhale and exhale and as is the child, um, and then regroup and, and continue on a regular treatment path. Um, Madam Chair and committee members, I can respond to, I, I can't respond to the details, but I've worked with many families who um, strongly need respite care, who wait and wait and wait. I, I'm thinking of a patient who has a developmental disability as well as a medical uh, condition type 1 diabetes whose mother spends most of her days um, seeking care, providing providing help, um, has been in, uh, her child has been in the hospital, S just needing a weekend away, just needing some time to do some of her own self-care and her own mental health, not getting that respite care, that wears away at her own mental health, and when that wears away at her mental health, her child suffers. So when um, you know, my sense is that there is not enough at this time respite care, and that's what we would want. Thank you, Dr. Gerson. Senator Aki. Thank you. That's it. Any other questions? Senator Abler. Well, thanks, Madam Chair. I think these bills, this is another example of something that uh, would just be, I mean, it's, it's quite a potpourri of, uh, of good ideas, and um, there's times I wish I was you, and then well, I still wish that. But, um, but so, uh, as you, uh, you're a thoughtful, good chair, Madam Chair, and some of the choices in front of you that you're going to wish you could do are going to just torture you. Um, but this is there's a really a lot of good substance in this thing between the respite and the mileage and the enhanced rates and uh, more beds and you know it's um, I've been acquainted with a few families in some of these circumstances, and it's just hellish. And nobody wins, you know, and uh, the, if you call them a child, they're, they're barely children, but they're, they're pretty big children sometimes. And, and they, um, it's, just, it's just a horrifying time, and then occasionally you lose them, and that's even worse. So um, there's, a, there's a lot to love here, Madam Chair, so I'll just put a little plug on this one. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Abler. Any other comments? Uh, Senator Morrison, um, it does seem like a very comprehensive bill, and there are, um, we do hear about um, situations where kids aren't able to access what they need at the right time, and it's, it's really um, heartbreaking to hear about that. So thank you for bringing this forward. Do you have any final comments? 
Thank you for your consideration, Madam Chair. And I, I also wanted to thank my co-authors, um, Hoffman, Bolden, <coughs> Coleman, and Mann. So, you know, good bipartisan recognition of the importance of this. Uh, the kids' mental health crisis that we're facing certainly is not a partisan issue. And I just want to reiterate that this, this um, potpourri, as Senator Abler put it, of um, ideas was brought together by the Mental Health Legislative Network, which is 30 provider and advocacy organizations who meet, uh, I believe they meet weekly. So this is, these are the people doing the work who understand acutely what is needed right now to get children and families the care that they desperately need right now. Um, and so I just, I can't emphasize um, enough the importance of this bill. And I just want to thank you all for your consideration. Thank you, Senator Morrison. Um, and Senate file 1174 as amended will be laid over for possible inclusion. And next we have uh, Senator Morrison has Senate file 1465. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. And this bill, I'm being told, does not have an amendment. Um, Senator, yes. Senator Morrison, please proceed with presenting your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, members, Senate File 1465 um, is a bill that was crafted a couple of years ago with a medical student, Christopher Prokash, who is here tonight to testify. Um, this bill ensures that all patients um, have access to advanced care planning. Advanced care planning is a discussion between the health professional and their patient um, to discuss the patient's health care wishes if that patient becomes unable to make decisions about the patient's care. It includes a discussion of future health care decisions that may need to be made and how the patient can let others know their preferences and decisions. Um, it also includes an explanation of healthcare directives and similar documents. It helps patients direct their own end-of-life care in accordance with their values and priorities. Um, and we found that on or under insurance is a barrier to historically served communities having access to this care. Um, ultimately, it provides peace of mind to Minnesotans and their families. So with that, Madam Chair, I will leave it to the testifiers. Thank you, Senator Morrison, and I see Dr. Dr. Reese, um, and uh, please state your name again for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Laurel Reese. I'm a family physician here in St. Paul and a president-elect of the Minnesota Medical Association, and I'm speaking on behalf of the 10,000 physician members of the Minnesota Medical Association and our student and um, physicians in training um, in support of SF1465. Um, when we use these decisions that we're talking about um, are in situations when a patient is unable to speak for themselves. It might be an emergency or it might be end of life, but that's when we're using this information and we're facing questions about medical treatment that patients can't always answer at that time. And it's also not the time to begin a discussion about what somebody wants, especially when we were anticipating something happening for them. And what we want for our patients is for them to get the care that they want. Um, and to get that care, a lot of times there are things that they need to understand that we need to discuss with them, the specifics of their situation. It depends if you have cancer or heart failure, what a person's going to experience and in, in the times when they might be needing to use this advanced care planning. And so we need a chance to be able to talk to people about this in advance so that when they arrive at the hospital and they're sick, you know, they, they had cancer and now they have pneumonia, they already have an idea of what they want and they are able to articulate that to our care teams and to their family members. Um, I found it's also helpful for our patients' loved ones to have a care plan in place because what happens is, is it's really hard when your loved one's sick to make those hard choices and there's a lot of feelings of grief and guilt that go into it. So it's also helpful for family members to have this in place. And SF 1465 provides medical assistance coverage for the conversations related to preparing for future decisions. Um, having meaningful conversations with your loved ones is the most important 
part of this. So really talking to the people who are going to be making decisions on your behalf is important, but also having conversations with physicians or other health care providers in advance is key to really being able to make those good decisions for yourself. Um, Medicare provides coverage for advanced care planning services already, and it's time to ensure that medical assistance and Minnesota Care also provide coverage for these essential services to ensure that patients' care decisions are followed when they become incapacitated and unable to express their own wishes. SF-1465 will provide coverage for MA patients to have these discussions and to plan for their own future health care needs. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Christopher Prokosh, please, please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Christopher Prokosh, and I'm here in support of SF-1465 as a medical student from the University of Minnesota. Advanced care planning is foundational to good health care because it helps patients to communicate their values and their health care goals. Hospitals can be a very scary place for patients, uh, but advanced directives allow us as providers to honor the choices that a patient has made with the goal of dignity for those patients and their families. But far too often, I've seen patients with life-threatening illnesses who have yet to be asked about their, their end-of-life wishes. These, deci these decisions about invasive procedures or being put on a ventilator are difficult to make even after significant reflection. So imagine how much harder those choices are to make during a stressful and painful hospital stay. While advanced care planning efforts have grown, it is still an underutilized tool. Research indicates that less than half of people 65 and older have an advanced directive, and rates of advanced directives in elderly lower income communities can be as low as 20%. Advanced directives are often best completed in an outpatient setting with a trusted provider. While time can be a barrier, this bill allows providers to be compensated for the extra time they spend on advanced care planning. Additionally, expanding coverage to patients on Minnesota Care allows greater access in communities with the lowest advanced directive completion rates. I helped write this bill with Senator Morrison for several reasons. Advanced care planning saves hospitals and patients money, it lessens the burden on family to make decisions for their loved one, and it gives the patient the autonomy and dignity to choose their health care. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and for your work on the bill. Yeah, so, thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, questions or comments? Senator Abler. Well, thanks. And, uh, you know, I just, uh, I was just reading your, your medical student, uh, Mr. Prokash. That's uh, good for you. Yeah, um, you know, we had some pharmacist students that actually created a whole pharmacy. Uh, a drug recycling program from nursing homes and it's actually grown and so you know we need fresh ideas once in a while so thank you for that. Um, Senator Morrison I appreciate the bill um, you know we uh, for the uh, to the public and whoever we, we uh, at the end of life discussion is it's a very controversial one sometimes but Senator Morrison I think on this topic you and I have found a consensus here which I think makes a lot of sense um, and where people talk about it. Uh, it's, it's not something we're good at, um, and, but people need to do. So that then, uh, I just laid our dad to rest and, a year ago, and so we, everybody's gone through it, so I'm, I'm not special about that. But uh, he was a cool guy, but he knew what he wanted, and so he just did that, and it was, he got the pass at home, which was cool. Um, but so if you know what you don't want to do and what you want to do, then it's so much better. And it occurs to me that uh, I, I haven't got any memos from the, the health plans or anything here, but it seems like this actually would be something that would be smart just to add in to the repertoire of things that we do routinely. Because the last six months of care uh, is amongst the most expensive and amongst some of the times the most pointless care uh, that I'm uncomfortable to not deliver um, to somebody who thinks they want it, but at least the people know ahead of time that it should actually save money. And so I, um, it would seem like to me that the health plan should just volunteer without having to take this to commerce and like just say, we're gonna include this and we wanna make this part of our, out of part of our service that we do to people. And for sure in the medical assistance side where so many of these individuals don't have an advocate and their care is spotty and their um, lives are you know, not always connected like they might be, it would be a really good idea. So. And anyway, I wanted to emphasize, Senator Morrison, that we agree on something in this, in this slice of life, but this is, a, I think, a really productive idea, and then people can just, um, you know, 
focus on the personal interactions as you're going through and not feel guilty or whatever. So, but what they didn't do. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Abler. Um, other members, Senator Adkey. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, um, Senator Abler touched on a, a few of the things uh, kind of angling towards cost, and it's just, as we move forward, it's, it's kind of that curiosity because um, this hasn't uh, been, or hasn't gone before the mandate review to know, and I'm just kind of wondering how detailed it really is. We're talking MA and Minnesota care, but you know, where does CGIP and the commercial, the commercial plans come into play on this. Um, so I'm kind of wondering if it isn't something that we shouldn't get a little more detail there to see. It, I would hope that it's minimal, but you just never know um, how detailed or whatever this would be. So the um, question I did have, and maybe the, the, the doctor could answer, is this something that sometimes takes place with a normal op office visit, somebody's in for s certain types of care or physical or whatever that it could be included. Um, a lot of what I think we talked about, it sounded like it was more of a special visit to do this, but would it be more common to do them with preventive care when that patient is in the office? Dr. Rees? Thank you. Um, they, we have these conversations at all kinds of different times in care. Somebody might come in with a recent hospitalization and we have this discussion about how their illness has become worse, for example, and we would talk about, okay, let's plan for next time you're in the hospital. We might have it at a physical exam. So somebody comes in for a physical and they mention, hey, doc, you know, I was kind of thinking about this. I want to get this on paper. So these are things, or we might have somebody who is really facing the end of their life and we know that they're, they're going to die in the near future and those people sometimes will just schedule an appointment let's sit down and work on this together I have questions what is it like to die of pneumonia or of cancer and what can I do like these are my priorities I, I want um, you know my priest there I want um, music I really want my pain controlled or I want to be alert I'd rather be in pain and be alert so that I can be present for my family these are the conversations that we have but it happens at all different points in care um, and it takes time because these aren't short conversations so it's really helpful to have to be able to meet with people where they're at and be able to help them plan their future care. Sandra Adke. Thank you Madam Chair and just one little follow-up for the doctor. You already said these could be they aren't just a short little visit. Can you give us a rough average? I know that everybody is different but you you know just an average, just a, for curiosity. Two to 20 Dr. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it really depends on the details of what the person is in there for. I have some people who are chronically ill, and I it comes up in conversation where they say, you know, um, Doc, if my kidneys fail, I don't want dialysis. And I said, let's pull out the paper, let's get this on paper, and just write this down. And that's a quick conversation. Sometimes it's an entire 20 minute visit where we're going through all the nuts and bolts of everything. Um, so it really depends if we're fitting into another visit or if it's a visit onto itself, how long it might take. Senator Rodkey. That's all. Thank you. Thank Any you. other member questions? Senator Abler? Madam Chair, if I just quit listening to the discussion, I wouldn't have to ask so many questions. But you just kind of provoked a thought there. It seems like, I mean, two to 20 minutes uh, maybe is good for the time you have in a busy practice. But some of these, what I'm imagining is a discussion like with maybe in the clinic so a doctor could be consulted if you need to have a question about something specific, but with some kind of a, you know, person who's a facilitator type, a social worker, counselor, somebody like that to help just deal with the fact that I mean, we don't face death very well. And so when you're talking about it, that is really hard. And in mean, no respect, disrespect to your time, but two to 20 minutes is like how to get them to even trust the, the, the person you're talking to. So anyway, I, I think there's merit in this. And I, mm -hmm. you know, anyway, I just wanted to put that plug back in. But it, to, make it, to make it effective. And then they're not going to want to do some of those heroic things that are so expensive and so torturous. And um, I don't know, I just... Anyway, I'm done. But just uh, thank you for the discussion. Thank you, Senator Abler. Yes, I think it, it, I guess my question um, would be if this is designated as a um, 
as a term, advanced care planning services, do you think that that will give that will be something that doctors will then know about and then be able to make more deliberate choices to say I'm you know I'm going to do this or proactively do this because I think um, I guess my in my experience it's been more of a very small have you um, thought about um, creating an advanced directive and then they hand you a folder and then it's like, oh, well, no, I haven't done that yet. But, um, you know, what, do you think that by designating this as a service, is that um, going to help make it more of a, a proactive approach? Thank you, Madam Dr. Chair. Dr. Reese. There is, a, there is existing uh, Medicare coverage already, so we're already mm -hmm. familiar with coding for this when we do take a little lengthier discussion. In other patient groups, for example, we, uh, we do counseling for smoking cessation, for example, where it's a little extra charge for the additional time that we've spent on that particularly important issue. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions or comments? Um, Dr. Or, yeah, Senator Dr. Morrison, do you have any other final comments about your bill? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. No, I, I'm really grateful to the testifiers, um, the doctor and the doctor in training um, uh, for their comments. And, and Senator Abler, I really appreciated your comments too. It is, you know, we have to get better at talking about uh, the different stages of life and we all inevitably die. And it's really helpful to have these conversations with our healthcare providers um, so that we can be educated about what to expect to the degree that, that we can and to think ourselves too and talk with our families about what we want um, that to look like. So appreciate the conversation and I appreciate your consideration of this bill. Thank you, Senator Morrison. And so Senate file 1465 will be laid over for possible inclusion and we will talk with Commerce as well about, about the bill. Um, and last on our list tonight, um, Senate File 1967, Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I uh, Madam Chair members, thank you. I believe there is an amendment that we need to pass out here. Yes, Madam Chair, you're right. Oh, thank you. Some of us received it already, and some of us are just getting it now. So Senator Morrison offers the A1 author's amendment. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. The amendment is adopted. Senator Morrison. Uh, Madam Chair members, thank you for considering Senate Bill 1967. Um, epilepsy is a condition defined by unprovoked recurring seizures. About 55,000 Minnesotans are living with epilepsy and of those about a third have uncontrolled seizures. One in 150 people with uncontrolled seizures may die from sudden, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. These sudden deaths are the leading cause of death in children and young adults with uncontrolled seizures. Those at highest risk are those who have convulsive seizures while unattended at night. Evidence strongly supports that first aid during or shortly after convulsive seizures can be life-saving and seizure detection devices ensure people with epilepsy are able to receive the, that attention as soon as possible. These devices are covered under some commercial plans but not medical assistance. Covering these devices under MA will ensure access to these potentially life-saving devices for people with seizures regardless of income. Um, I do want to thank my um, co-authors that span our committee, um, Senators Abler, Hoffman, um, Bolden, and Odke, too. And I do believe, Madam Chair, that I have a testifier. Yes, Senator Morrison. Um, Glenn Lloyd, and please state your name. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name and begin your testimony. For sure. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Glenn Lloyd, and I'm the CEO of the Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota. Our mission is to lead the fight to overcome the challenges of living with epilepsy and to accelerate therapies to stop seizures, find cures, and save lives. I'm here to speak in support of Senate File 1967, which covers seizure detection devices under medical assistance. 
advancing health equity in our state. Nationally, 50% of adults living with epilepsy, with active epilepsy, have an annual family income uh, averaging less than $25,000 a year. And about 33% of people with epilepsy are covered under Medicaid. Seizure detection devices can reduce the risk of death and increase quality of life for people living with epilepsy. They alert caregivers when a seizure is occurring so they are able to provide immediate first aid and mitigate potential complications, include sudden unexpected death in epilepsy, otherwise known as SUDEP, status epilepticus, suffocation, and or head injury. Sadly, as mentioned before, one in 150 young adults with uncontrolled seizures will die from SUDEP. In addition to income inequities that exist in epilepsy, substantial racial inequities exist in access to care and in outcomes. According to research, African Americans are more likely to experience status epilepticus, and the African American community uh, has the highest age-adjusted death rate for epilepsy from 2005 to 2014. In addition, black and multiracial infants and children were one point, uh, one and a half times more likely to die from SUDEP than white infants and children. Please support Senate File 1967. Covering these devices under medical assistance will ensure that there are no financial barriers to accessing these potentially life-saving devices for individuals living with epilepsy. Thank you for your time and support of the epilepsy community. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Members, any questions or comments? Senator Bolden. Not a question, but just to thank you to Senator Morrison for carrying this bill as a neuro nurse who's taking care of many patients with uh, seizures and the mom of a son with seizures. Uh, it, this is important and it matters. I also had a, a recently a conversation with some constituents um, whose daughter uh, lived with seizures and the peace of mind that, that, that this device um, provided for her family um, was striking in my conversation with them. So this does make a big difference in the lives of Minnesotans, so thank you. Thank you, Senator Abler. So Mr. Lloyd, thanks. Um, and I didn't know all that demographic information. That's really interesting, the income piece and the racial side. I didn't know any of that. Um, can you tell me how these devices work? I, I remember I was briefed, but I kind of forgot. So can you just give me the short version of how they, you don't know what's coming, but it, it's happening, and then just can you just briefly tell me how it works? Mr. Lloyd? Chair, uh, Senator Abler, uh, members of the committee, the devices uh, monitor uh, on the risk, very similar to taking biometric information in real time. This is FDA approved, the, the device uh, that is on the market currently, and so it's monitoring um, heart rate and a, a couple other factors that are proprietary to obviously the companies that design these, uh, but they've proven in particular to register seizures uh, that, that are full body and oftentimes uh, have proven to been, be quite effective, particularly at night. Uh, when the highest incidents of SUDEP occur. Yeah. Uh, Senator Abler. Uh, and how long have these been out? Uh, Mr. Lloyd. Chair, uh, Senator Abler, the, they have, uh, the FDA approval came online in 2020. Really? Senator Abler. I talk about this because it's good. Um, for people. Uh, my son passed from one of those, and he, if he had one of these, it might not have been fatal. And I never picked up on that even when we were chatting about this. Because um, he was, he came home with his friends, and they, they went to 10 o'clock, they went to bed, and he just had a seizure, fell on his bed, and aspirated, and they found him in the morning. But this little you know, a dinger thing, then somebody might have noticed that. So, I don't mean to make this all so personal, but, you know, we deal with like a 1.25 million people in our committee 
with so many needs. Uh, and you don't always know what they look like. They could be your neighbor, they could be any of us. And uh, so I'm happy that this got invented. And we tried to get this done last year, and it just didn't work. Um, anyway, so thank you. Thanks, Senator Abler. Um, Senator Morrison, any other comments about the bill? Uh, no, Madam Chair, but I, I do want to thank Senators Bolton and Abler for sharing their, their personal experiences and just illustrating how important this is and how it could be life-saving, how it is life-saving now. So thank you for considering and, and thank you to Dr. Taylor for being here. Thank you. Um, members, if no other questions or comments, um, we will lay Senate File 1967 over for possible inclusion. Thank you, Senator Morrison. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. And with that, we have gotten through our agenda and we are adjourned. Thank you, members. <laughs>